All right. So I'm going to ask you all to come with me to a place. It is very wet. It is very cool. Um, go ahead and close your eyes for a minute and listen with me. Now, those of you that have ever gone out at night in the springtime know what I'm talking about. You've heard these sounds before. And this is my favorite night of the year. This is, I think this is like naturalist Christmas. So there is a night or a few nights in the springtime when naturalist gets really excited. And what happens is it is dark. Maybe it's been raining all day long. It's February, March, maybe early April right when things are starting to thaw, things are starting to warm up a little bit, 45, 50 degrees, 55 degrees. The important thing is the rain. And a little secret, what all the naturalists do is we start texting each other, we start calling each other, is it tonight? Is it gonna be tonight? Like Santa's coming, right? And what we're looking for, what we're hoping is gonna happen is that the amphibians are gonna come out. So a lot of these guys, a lot of these frogs and toads and salamanders, are hidden all winter long. And then, but then when the weather is just right, that's when they come out. So we see them climb over snow, we see them come across roads, and what they're doing is they're heading to their natal ponds, the place where they were born, because it's time to breed, it's time to lay more eggs. This is a pretty awesome experience. So slowly, you know, it doesn't happen until pretty late. So we might go out, you know, eight o'clock, 8.30, it's been dark for a couple hours, it's still springtime, right? And you see one spotted salamander. Then a few minutes later, somebody else spots a wood frog. And then maybe you see a Jefferson's. And then over time, they all kind of creep out and they totally ignore you. They're on their own path, they're on their own journey, they're heading to those ponds and they will climb over whatever they have to climb over, um, they're on their way. So we try to protect them and make sure they're nice and safe. There's some areas where we close off roads, we close off trails, we make sure that anybody who does come out to see them has a flashlight and is very careful because we don't want them to get squished. You know, this happens in a lot of places throughout the country and they've been doing this for way long before um, humans were here, and before we built all of our infrastructure. So there's a lot of places where naturalists close roads, naturalists are out there late at night, in the dark, in the rain, trying to make sure these amphibians are safe. But this awesome migration, I think, is one of the very cool ways that amphibians are so spectacular. They're so special. So what happens is there's a group of salamanders known as mole salamanders, and they don't look like moles, but they do spend most of their lives underground in burrows that either they created or that are left over from another animal, especially all winter long, they're hanging out in their own burrow. But then when the time is right, when it's wet and it's warm, they start moving. Some of them might move quickly. Usually the males will come out first. So if there's a couple nights, maybe the first night, all the males come out, they wanna make sure they're there, they're ready. They come down to the ponds and hang out there. And then over the next couple of days, more and more amphibians will come. If it's really warm, there might be all sorts of different salamanders, different frogs, that clip I played for you, we had spring peepers, we had wood frogs go in. So some nights are really pretty crazy. And, you know, amphibian sounds and especially nature sounds go on all throughout the spring as everybody gets ready to breed. But those early spring calls is, uh, it warms my heart because winter in Cleveland is very long and it is very exciting to remember. Everybody's here, they're all back, um, summer is coming. So here's our spotted salamander. This is, I call this my glamour shot. She was out on the road in Brecksville Reservation um, maybe two or three years ago and um, got this great picture. So on, on her way to those natal ponds. So this guy, and I love these guys because they are so spectacular. They'll grow six to eight inches long. So they're pretty big. And a lot of people see them if you go camping in the Smokies way down south in a lot of those national parks, but they live here. They live here in Cleveland Metro Parks. 
um, and we just don't get to see them very much. So this is one of the times of year that they do come out and they are visible um, and they are very, very cool. Here's a Jefferson salamander who's coming across the snow. So they do, even though these guys are cold blooded, you know, their need to get to these ponds and breed and to be one of the first ones there to kind of pass on their genetic material, um, they are able to move through that snow, move through cool areas and get to those ponds. All right, so what are amphibians? So we're gonna talk about mostly what's in Cleveland Metro Parks, most of our common, um, common amphibians, but just as a reminder, going back to high school biology, amphibians include frogs and toads in the order Anura, and worldwide there's 3,500 of them. So there are a lot of frogs and toads, especially if you think about in the rainforest, like in South America, there's a lot of different species of frogs and toads. In North America, there's about 100 different species. And then in Cleveland Metro Parks, we have about nine. So some of our, you know, when we make our lists, sometimes uh, species are hypothetical. Maybe there's a report, but it's 50, 60 years ago. So we don't know for sure whether they're still around. Um, or maybe we know, okay, they're in Lake County. So they could be in Cleveland Metro Parks, but we haven't seen it. Um, so we're always working to update those that data and always keeping our eyes open. And that's something you can help with too. If you find something that's crazy, naturalists always wanna know. We also have our salamanders, order caudata. Worldwide, there's only 342 of them. So there's not that many different kinds of salamanders around the whole world. And in North America, we have 187, more than half. So North America really is a hotbed for salamanders. Um, and I think with our temperate climate, you know, it's not too cold, not too warm. Remember that these guys have moist skin. They need the world around them to be pretty wet. So somewhere warm and dry, it's not gonna be so good. So this area in Ohio is, is great for salamanders. So we have about 15 species of salamanders. And then there's another family of amphibians that we always forget about because they don't live here, but it's good to know. And they're called Sicilians. So Sicilians worldwide, there's 256 species, mostly dark. Um, they also have that smooth, slimy skin, just like our frogs and toads and salamanders. But the thing that makes them crazy is they don't have arms or legs. They kind of look like big worms. So I'm going to show you a picture now, just so I want to warn you. So here is a Sicilian. Pretty crazy, right? Some of them get up to five feet long, which is insane. So these guys are mostly in like South America, um, along the coast or in the rainforest or, you know, Central Africa, kind of in areas where it's more moist. And they're very rarely seen because they live almost all their lives underground. But obviously some people do find them. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of places where they are, they are often killed because they're mistaken for snakes. And if you, have a, a, if you live in a village and you find a, a snake you're not sure about or you think it might be venomous, fortunately, they're often put to death. But these guys are a pretty interesting creature. And you know, the other thing about amphibians, especially the Sicilians, because they're hard to find, is there's a lot we don't know. We, this is something science needs a lot more research on, especially the salamanders and the Sicilians because they're so secretive. So if you're interested in biology, if you're interested in learning more, um, we need a lot more research. There's a lot more to learn. So this is just going back when I said that we have a lot of salamanders and amphibians in North America. The darker green areas is where there's more amphibian richness. So certainly South America in the rainforest, going into North America, those are areas where there's a lot of different species of amphibians. And so that makes it you know, really special. I always like to think about our sense of place. Here in Ohio, You know, growing up, I learned a lot about the rainforest. I could name all these species, which is really cool. The rainforest is a really important place. But the world we have here in Northeast Ohio and our natural features are also really important. So it is very cool to learn about the things that live here, that are special, that are unique. So what is an amphibian? The word amphibious means they're leading a double life. So there is generally an aquatic gill-breathing larval stage. So they're, they're juvenile stage and a terrestrial lung-breathing adult. 
mostly, maybe, these guys, everybody breaks the rules, right? In nature, nobody does exactly what you want them to do. They are cold-blooded, so they're affected by the, the temperature around them. If it's really warm, they might be more active. If it's really cool, they're gonna slow down, go to sleep, their metabolism slows, right? And they all have this smooth, moist skin, and that moisture allows for oxygen intake. So some of the adult amphibians don't have lungs at all. And the only way they can intake oxygen, they might pull it in through their mouth, um, but they, they're they actually taking it in through their skin, which is pretty crazy. So really when we think about what amphibians need, so that need to stay moist is very, very important. There's a ton of different kinds of amphibians. These are all Northeast Ohio amphibians. So here is our mud puppy who actually stays in its juvenile stage its entire life. It's got those gills, those red things sticking out of the side of its head are gills, crazy external gills. And so that redness, we know it's taking in oxygen. They kind of flutter around and they live their entire life underwater. And these guys are found in Cleveland Metro Parks. Not everywhere, but they can be, which is pretty awesome. This is our red eft, the juvenile stage of our red spotted newt. And we will revisit as the evening goes on our red salamander and i just think they are beautiful so sometimes like that mud puppy they kind of blend in the earth around them and then that red salamander really stands out this is our spring peeper i love this picture on the leaf because it shows how tiny they are they are little and um, they spend their lives a lot of them kind of in shrubbery um, but then sometimes they, they will come out and we'll get to find them in the springtime pretty awesome Here's our American toad, probably our most common, most well-loved amphibian. They are very versatile. You know, they're able to live in a number of different habitats, so they are pretty easy to find. And then this guy is not from Northeast Ohio, but I had to pop him in there. This is from about a year ago. I was on my honeymoon in Costa Rica, and it was kind of the end of this really long hiking day. We had been active all day with this guide and this big group we were all exhausted and he said oh do you guys want to go to the the pond where the red-eyed tree frogs breed and i uh i think beat the entire crowd there <laughs> and um, they couldn't understand how why i was so excited but these guys are so special and it just was so cool to me to find this little pond where they were all singing um it was dusk you can see my, the light's not very good but this is just one example of a tropical amphibian there's all of that diversity, especially in the tropics, where these guys might be hanging out near a pond. There's other frogs who spend their entire lives in the tops of trees. We don't have enough moisture here for that, um, but there is such diversity. They are pretty amazing. So just a reminder about the amphibian life cycle, and I will admit this picture of eggs is salamander eggs, um, not frog eggs, so don't hold that against me. So the reason I know that is because you can see that there's little tiny black eggs and then they're all kind of encased in this jelly-like envelope. So frog eggs are kind of individual. It would be a clump of eggs, but they're all individual little balls. And then toad eggs, if you ever find them, are actually laid in a long string. So, you know, toad eggs, usually it would look like kind of like a, a big pile of giant, giant clear spaghetti. And then, you know, as they grow, there might be dark and light sides, depending on what's facing the sun. But these guys are salamander eggs pulled right out of the pond. In, in North Chagrin, we have a ton of ponds, lots and lots of salamander eggs. They're easy to find. So the young are in these aquatic eggs laid in the water, right? They don't come out of the mom that big and squishy. She lays her eggs, they take on water. So just like how the amphibian skin as is moist and kind of needs to stay moist, takes in water, takes in oxygen, the eggs are the same way. They can take in, they take in that moisture um, and take in what they need, they can absorb that as well. Then there's our tadpole, right? Or this one's baby frog, baby salamanders look similar. And they are mostly, you know, baby frogs are mostly herbivorous. They might be chewing on if there's algae, um, maybe detritus, dead plants, that kind of thing. And then as they get bigger, they might grow those legs, kind of lose that keeled swimming tail, and then turn into an adult. So these guys, um, 
they're not shedding their skin. They're not totally changing their body. They're just kind of growing, changing in shape, um, changing in morphology, kind of the way their body looks and acts, um, kind of a, a generalized life cycle. So here's a baby salamander in the egg, which I think is just awesome. And you can see the shape is different from those, those baby frogs or toads. So they're often, their body shape is a little longer. You can really see their external gills. So most young salamanders have those external gills, just like that mud puppy that I showed you. And um, as they grow, you can, you can really see them. You know, if you're looking from a boardwalk down on the water, baby, baby frogs, and baby salamanders look pretty much the same. You get them in a net or in your hand, you can tell the difference. They are pretty cool. So the frogs and toads we have in Cleveland Metro Parks um, are family of tree frogs, hylidae, gray tree frog, our spring peeper, we looked at earlier, who's tiny, as well as the midland chorus frog, our true toads, American toad, who is very common, fowler's toad, who is, you know, might hybridize sometime with the American toad, could be around, that's kind of one of those ish um, animals we have in Cleveland Metro Parks, but then our frogs, the ranidae, Bullfrogs, green frogs, super, super common. Those guys are, if you're seeing a frog in a pond, chances are it's one of those two. Uh, pickerel frog, northern leopard frog, and our wood frog. Our salamanders, see we got a lot more. But the other thing that's cool about these amphibians is 40 species of amphibians in Cleveland Metro Parks is pretty learnable. Uh, I love birds, but 200 species of birds in Cleveland Metro Parks takes a lot more work to learn. So just saying, if you feel like learning your salamanders, uh, pretty doable with some flashcards. So our mole salamanders, the family Ambistomatidae, those are the guys who are mostly who are migrating. They're spending most of their lives underground, alone, um, and then when it's time to breed, finding their way down to the ponds. That's our Jefferson salamander, our spotted salamander, who's that black one with the yellow dots, the marbled salamander, smallmouth salamander, and then ambistoma species unidentifiable, which I will get back to. Puppy we already met, who's is spending its entire life underwater. Our newts are true salamanders, they call them. That's our eastern newt, our red spotted newt. And then we have the plethodonts, which are a lungless salamander. So they don't really, they don't have the muscles to, to be taking in oxygen the same way that we do. Um, they are really only absorbing that moisture through their skin um, or th through their, the membranes in their mouth and nose. It's pretty amazing. So lots of species, dusky salamanders, northern two-lined, four-toed. Some of these guys are more common than others. Our red-backed salamander is very common um, as well as our two-lined. Now, I know I said, this, these ambistoma salamanders. So this is an example. This is one of the mole salamanders and it is a hybrid. And what makes this, this, this lady wild is it's a hybrid of a number of different salamander species, um, but they have been around for millions of years. So it's not just like one hybrid individual. This is a species um, that is a mix of all these different salamanders. So they are genetically a mix of the blue spotted salamander. You can kind of see those blue spots, right? The small mouth salamander, tiger salamander, who doesn't even exist here, right? That's from some time in the past. The Jefferson salamander and the streamside salamander. And these are all females. So what happens is the, the female salamanders, um, who could be a mix of any of this genetic material, might pick up salamanders pick up male genetic material before laying their eggs so they might pick up the genetic material from any of these species the spotted um, the jeffersons who are very common but then the eggs that they lay could be an entirely different mix of genetic material it's crazy it's not it's not like my scientific career did not prepare me for learning about this it blew my mind um, and so they actually only lay eggs that grow up to be female. The males, male eggs are not viable, do not survive, which is pretty crazy. So there is a species that is all female. It's called the Ambistoma hybrid complex. Um, and look, look it up because they're pretty wild. So sometimes, you know, if you ha do happen to be out at night with a naturalist and it's raining and you're looking for salamanders, 
sometimes they might find one and not be able to tell you what species it is. And that's because it could be this crazy mix of genetic material and there really is no way to tell. So sometimes that happens. But the original hybridization occurred two and a half to four million years ago. So these ladies have been around for a long time, um, which is, is pretty amazing. So these guys are, are pretty wild. So what habitats do amphibians live in? Um, here I think is a great image of a vernal pool, which I know we talk about a lot. And that is a pond or body of water um, that is really special because it is temporary. So it might be known as an ephemeral pond or a temporary pond. And these are places where in the spring rains or when um, the, all the snow melts, they're gonna fill up with water um, and it'll persist through the spring, but it's not gonna be there all year. And the key about not having water all year is that there's no fish, fish can't live there because fish love to eat little baby amphibian eggs, little baby tadpoles, this bluegill would, would love to eat those. Um, so these vernal pools that are temporary bodies of water are really, really special. Now, if you lay your eggs in February, March, April, you're not guaranteed that those eggs are gonna survive all the way till summer for your young to be able to grow up, right? So sometimes I have seen a little pond, a little vernal pool full of eggs, and then we happen to have a couple dry weeks and it dries all the way up. And unfortunately, that's kind of, it's kind of a wild kingdom thing, right? Sometimes your young just don't survive. But usually these amphibians are coming back to where they were born. It's likely to, gonna be a successful place to lay your eggs. Hopefully they'll be able to survive there um, and kind of live in this little, this vernal pool, this kind of nursery where lots of insects lay their young. You know, we find dragonfly larvae, lots of tadpoles, all sorts of stuff. It's a pretty special habitat. Some amphibians you might be able to find in the forest floor, certainly American toads, especially in an area where there might be a creek or a pond nearby. Once they grow up and become adults, they really have need a lot less moisture than many other amphibians. So they might wander about to find, you know, a place that where they feel comfortable, they can find their own territory and where there's enough moisture for them to, to hide in and to be safe in when things do dry up a little bit. And some of our other species are red-backed salamander. You know, I find all throughout the forests, under a log, under a piece of bark, um, you kind of never know where, where they're going to be. So as adults, they're much less bound to the water. A stream. So we have a number of salamanders that we do find mostly near streams um, that you might find under rocks nearby. You know, and you want somewhere that's going to be have lots of still places that rush in water hard for little guys to hold on, right? Salamanders are not so much built for that. Um, but on the edges, kind of, you know, on those, those hillsides, under the rocks, under the leaves, it's going to be nice and wet, repeatedly flooded. That is a great habitat for a lot of these guys, especially those lungless salamanders. And then we've got our big ponds. So many, especially of our frogs, um, this is, you know, we're looking for bullfrogs. You don't find a bullfrog in a little tiny stream. You don't find a bullfrog on the forest floor. You're finding them in big ponds where there's lots of food, there's lots of space. Um, our bullfrogs and our green frogs, they are laying their eggs. Their eggs and tadpoles are kind of hanging out on those edges where they can be a little bit safer in the shallows. Maybe they can hide among the plants. Um, and then that's kind of where they spend the rest of their lives. So as we've talked about, you know, the lives of these amphibians, things they really need. They have special adaptations for retaining moisture because that they need to have that moist skin to be able to breathe. For defending themselves, they need to be able to protect themselves and their young, right? And then surviving winter. These guys are living, these tiny little cold-blooded creatures, remember are living here in Northeast Ohio. I don't know where you are, but where I am, it's, uh, it's like 15 degrees outside. It's pretty cold out there. So they've got some special features to allow them to survive. This is one thing I think is really cool. This is a Jefferson salamander, a mole salamander, and a special body feature they have. On the side of this guy, it kind of looks like there's ribs, right? It looks like you can almost see his ribs. Those are actually a special feature for moisture. 
They're called costal grooves. And what they do, this is crazy, is they allow the body to pick up moisture as it's walking. So if this salamander is moving and grooving, you know, across some grass, across some leaves, it happens to walk over something wet where they're kind of going to try to stay, those grooves actually will suck up like some capillary action, will suck up that moisture and spread it throughout the skin to help keep their body moist, I think is pretty amazing. They do have a lot of defenses. Um, number one, salamanders have teeth, which is pretty crazy. I've never seen them, but I believe I believe it when I hear it. Um, and they are, as adults, mainly, you know, our salamanders are mainly carnivores. So they do have teeth. Um, some of their other defenses, certainly camouflage, they could blend in, right? Um, they, there's certainly their behavior. So a lot of these guys are pretty secretive. They're hanging out in spots where nobody's really gonna find them. You know, even a bird who might like to eat a salamander isn't going digging under the ground for them. Um, so, so those behaviors really help keep them safe. Um, salamanders all have tail autonomy, which is pretty crazy, which means their tail can fall off and they are just fine. So that is a great defensive mechanism. They might have aposomatic or warning coloration. Those spotted salamanders, the black with yellow spots, they're a little bit toxic. So if you were an owl and happened to pick one up, those yellow spots are saying, just like throughout the animal kingdom, whoa, you better think twice. I probably taste pretty bad. So that is, is a great way to keep yourself safe. And then there's also salamanders who have pseudo aposomatic coloration, which means they're pretending to be toxic. So just like I'm sure you've heard of the, the viceroy butterfly, who is, does not taste bad, but is pretending to be the monarch butterfly who does taste bad who eats milkweed, um, there's salamanders who do that as well, who might be imitating another salamander who's a little bit poisonous. Pretty cool. Salamanders sometimes have anti-predator postures, which is very cool. Couldn't find a picture, I'm so sorry, but something you can look up. So there are some salamanders who are bland colored, maybe brown or black on their back, but then their belly is orange, yellow, brightly colored. And if they're under attack, they might throw their head back, lift up their tail, so that those bright colors are kind of what show off. The other thing is that you might show off your tail, you might have your tail kind of over your head, because your tail might be the area that's toxic. So you wanna protect yourself with the part of you that tastes bad and that you can grow back. Um, so just like in the rest of the animal kingdom, the head, is, and the, the head and the heart are always the most important things. But if you're really in a pinch and you gotta lose your tail, Luckily, salamanders are able to grow that back. They also might have toxic secretions. So some of them, kind of like if you've ever picked up a slug and all of a sudden your hand is covered in this nasty orange goo um, that is really hard to wash off, that's a toxic secretion. They're saying, leave me alone. Um, some salamanders can do that as well, which is pretty amazing. So this is so cool. Speaking of salamander regeneration, um, and this is another night I was out, you know, working at, at amphibian migration and the salamander happened. I was standing there having a conversation. Salamander walked over my shoe. It's fine. I just, just stood there, waited for him to move. Um, but I happened to notice he is missing the tip of his tail, which is so crazy. So these guys, salamanders, have this awesome thing that re they can regrow their limbs, their tails, their arms, their legs. Um, they can regrow it, which is pretty crazy. Now, it's not, they're not superheroes, right? It takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, like three months or so, to regrow those limbs. But it's a lot better than being eaten. So, you know, one of the very cool things about salamanders is there's a lot of researchers trying to learn about how they can do this. What cells are they using? What genes are turned on or off? How similar is it to anything humans can do? Um, so that medically, you know, I don't think that I'll be able to regrow an arm, but there's instances where that could be, could be a really useful thing to know how to do. So that is pretty cool. So this guy, we can see obviously his tail broke off and it's growing back slowly. Um, and he kind of kept moving on to the pond. So I think he was doing just fine. Um, dealing with winter. So this is a wood frog and these guys can freeze solid in winter. Now, not all amphibians can do that. Um, you know, many of our pond frogs, 
um, are, or even tadpoles are hanging out just with, with the fish and the turtles, at the bottom of the pond in the water, and their metabolism slows way down. So they don't need as much oxygen. They're just kind of sitting there hanging out until things warm up. Many of our other salamanders, same thing. They find a nice uh, safe place where they can hide out as their body temperature goes down. Um, but they're not going to freeze totally solid. But this guy, the wood frog, I always remember he's kind of got, it looks like he's got black eyeliner on. Um, these are, these guys are found in the forest. I often find them under leaves on the forest floor. Um, and this guy can freeze totally solid. It is wild. I have found them because I have a job where I'm out in the forest with kids all winter long. Um, say we're playing games. This kid brought me a frog and he's like, oh, it's dead. You know, I found a dead frog. No, it was just a frog popsicle. Um, he was just just hanging out, waiting for, for winter to be over. So we, you know, put it back on the forest floor, covered it up with leaves, left it alone. Um, so that is a pretty, very cool adaptation to be able to deal with, with winter. It's not like these guys can migrate. They don't move very fast. They don't move very far. Here is our red spotted newt who has some other very cool um, adaptations. So the little guy you see kind of up on the left hand side is the teenager of the same species. And then the big greener guy is the adult. So the adult red spotted newt lays its eggs in a pond um, and the babies, little, little salamander tadpoles grow up, they're eating, they're eating. Eventually, you know, after maybe a year, depending on these guys, their life cycle really depends on the resources around them. If they're really crowded, maybe they're gonna move on quicker. If there's not enough food, it might take them longer to develop. Um, so years are kind of, it depends on the individual and what's going on around them. So after a year or so, they become teenagers, that little orange red F, and leave the water and are totally terrestrial for a few years, which is wild, right? So they, you know, we see them on um, lots of times the edges, uh, hike, hiking trails, edges over streams or ponds, maybe they've climbed up um, and they are, they're mostly hiding out. They're eating, they're carnivorous, they're eating bugs and worms and other invertebrates. And when we see them, you know, another good time to go looking for amphibians is right after rain when it's kind of warm out. Like if you go to South Chagrin, in and walk one of the forested trails two hours after a rainstorm in June, I bet you there will be red Fs everywhere. They are crazy. So I often find them on like mossy, the bases of trees, because that's kind of when it's moist. Even though they're terrestrial, they still need that water around them. Um, they, that's when they're out hunting, looking for a new territory, moving around, then they'll kind of go back and hiding. But these guys don't have to hide so much. If you look at that bright color, those bright spots, they're toxic. They taste bad. Um, so they are pretty much left alone to do their own thing, which is pretty cool. Then after a couple of years, once they've grown enough, they're going to head back to those ponds where they were born, maybe somewhere else. And there you can see their color changes. You can see their back legs. The back legs of that red spotted newt are way bigger. Great for swimming, great for paddling, right? Their whole body shape changes back to be more aquatic. Their tail gets that keel, almost like a like a fish tail that's going to be good for swimming, and they spend the rest of their lives in the water. Pretty wild. It's a, a pretty wild life cycle. Now here's our gray tree frog, and these guys are, I love talking about these guys because people often don't know that they're around, and they're pretty common. So I'm going to play a gray tree frog for you. I hope you can hear it. They have kind of that trill, um, and they are pretty common. You know, sometimes in suburban areas, if you've got a pond nearby, um, this one's here at North Chagrin. But you know, these guys are very hard to find because they're coming down to little ponds to breed. But most of their lives, they are hanging out in the trees. They are are kind of way up there. So I hear we hear them a lot more than we see them. Something really cool about this guy and a lot of our frogs is that it can change color. So this one is, is pretty well camouflaged with this tree that it's on. Um, they don't change instantaneously like a chameleon, 
but over time their colors will change and um, individuals might be different colors based on kind of what tree they're on, that kind of thing. They're pretty awesome. So our American bullfrog, this is a big guy, right? So these ones are, are fairly common in um, big ponds. Um, so here is what a bullfrog sounds like. So they kind of have that jug of rum and their throat inflates to make that big call. Now, a lot of these frogs and toads all make sounds. Salamanders don't make, really make sounds. They are quiet. They are trying to be sneaky. Um, they're hoping to be in the right place at the right time when they're looking for a mate and ready to lay eggs. And they might do some displays, um, but frogs and toads are mostly using their voice. They want to be the loudest, the biggest, um, to be able to attract a mate. So our American toad, um, this the, the big picture where he's in the dark was I actually walked out of the nature center one night. I was doing a program. It was late. It was like 10 o'clock. It had just rained in the spring. And just sitting there on the pavement was this very noble toad staring up at the building. Um, and so I had to, you know, give him his five minutes of fame and, and take some pictures. So these guys, when it's wet, are moving around a lot. Um, we see them, you know, in the park, I always feel like there is a toadlet day when all of the little baby toads have left the water and are moving around looking for new territory. And there's so many of them and they are tiny, like the size of a dime. And um, it is very hard not to step on them. They're so cute. So there are, the toads are often leaving the water, spending a lot of their time in a more terrestrial area, and then just going back to the water when it's time to breed. So a lot of these guys do have color variations. That black one, that's an American toad. Um, it just happened to be a really dark color. And here's what the, the American toad sounds like. I'm sure you'll recognize it. Kind of that long trill. Um, their, their throat really inflates um, as they're saying. So here's our common mud puppy that that almost totally aquatic salamander, totally aquatic salamander, you know, couldn't survive. You can see those external gills. If it came out of the water, those would collapse, wouldn't be able to breathe. So just like a fish, this guy's got to stay in water its entire life. Um, so you can really see those gills, tiny little eyes, really not using eyes, probably using more sense of smell to find its way around. None of these guys, the salamanders, really are, do not have great sense of sight. They're using other senses. They also have that keeled tail for swimming. It's pretty awesome. So our spring peeper. So this guy, just like the tree frog, we often are only seeing in the springtime when they happen to come down. They're hanging out mostly, you know, on bark of shrubs, kind of in those a little more secluded areas. Um, they are not out and about being loud, but they they make very, very loud sounds. So here's our spring peeper. So they really are peeping, right? And that black X on their back is really kind of the key. Uh, that's how you know it's a spring peeper. So sometimes we see them, you know, quarter sized. They're, they're pretty little, maybe a little bit bigger. Here's our red-backed salamander, who really is, for me, probably the most common amphibian I see. So I'm often out in the forest looking under logs. And um, if you can see, there's two in this picture. And I love this picture because they do have great camouflage. So that kind of reddish back is really made to blend in with those dead leaves. Um, and that's exactly where they hang out. These guys are, are entirely terrestrial. So even though they have the same needs as other amphibians, because they are living kind of in the forest, they will, the females will actually lay their eggs in kind of wherever their territory is, maybe under a log, under some leaf litter, and um, protect those eggs rather than going to the water um, to have them, which I think is, is pretty interesting. So they go through their gill stage actually in the egg, and then once they come out of their 
their eggs, they are, um, these guys are lungless, but they are able to breathe the same way and they don't have gills. So these guys also have a, what's called a lead backed phase. So some of them you might find are almost totally black. Then it's just this kind of a color variation. These ones are very common in the forest um, and a great indication that you've got a, a good habitat. Now, it's not fair to talk about amphibians without um, thinking about the plight of the amphibian and how tough it is to be an amphibian. We've talked a lot about how much moisture and water is important to them. And water, which runs throughout our whole, you know, throughout our whole environment, as we know, is often the thing that carries a lot of the problems and is kind of an indicator. So we know that at least a third of amphibian species are in danger, 43% are in decline due to certainly habitat loss. These guys are pretty specific. Water quality is big. Um, maybe competition, we have a lot of other species, maybe invasive species moving in. Pollution, which really moves through the water and is hard to control. Disease um, and, and climate change as well. They really need particular climate um, to be able to survive. And so as these things change, you know, we wanna make sure that our amphibians are able to survive. So next steps, you know, things that we can do. So there are, in Ohio, we are really lucky with the way we monitor um, our biology. We are far, far advanced from many other states, which is awesome. So there is, if you're interested in working with amphibians, the Ohio Frog and Toad Calling Survey. We have, as Cleveland Metro Parks, a frog and toad calling survey. And we use volunteers who actually go out during the um, spring and summer to ponds. It has to be at night. And listen, so you get trained, you get tested to make sure you can identify these calls and we'll listen and write down, you know, what amphibians they're hearing. So we know who's there, um, when, are, when are they active, uh, when are things changing, which is pretty cool. So that's really important data. There's also salamander monitoring program through the state. Um, and there's great resources on the internet if you want to learn more. We do have Cleveland Metro Parks has planted animal checklists. If you're ever curious about what is in Cleveland Metro Parks, if you just Google Cleveland Metro Parks plant an animal checklist, you'll find we have, this is reptiles and amphibians, birds, uh, trees, all kinds of stuff. And that is a great resource to help you on as you're learning. And then the Ohio Division of Natural Resources makes great little field guides. So you know what they have or things that are gonna be local. But more individual actions. Um, certainly if you do find a, you know, toads are pretty durable. If you happen to find a toad, um, say you're with a kid, they wanna pick up the toad, um, you know, that's up to you. They will not give you warts. They do, however, have poison glands. So that, that can be irritating to people's skin. Um, one thing with any amphibian, because their skin needs to be moist, is you wanna make sure there's nothing on your hands, um, even to keep your hands nice and wet. If you pour some water from your water bottle on them, that's great. And really anybody besides a toad, it's probably not so safe to handle them because our, our hands can be dry, our hands can irritate them, and that skin is so important. It really isn't worth handling them just because they're so cool. Um, certainly eating organic because the thing, you know, one of the things that we talked about problems for amphibians is pesticides, herbicides, which once they're, they're put on a farmer's land, unfortunately, that's not where they stay. They're running through our streams and rivers and lakes and affecting everybody who lives there. Um, creating aquatic and terrestrial habitat. If you're in a position to have a pond in your backyard, to leave some areas with leaf litter, that is really important habitat. And then reducing pesticides and herbicides um, in the property that you manage is really, really important as well. Now I'm gonna leave you with this adorable spotted salamander because these slimy and spectacular amphibians are totally worth all of their work to keep them safe. And I just am so, was so impressed by this individual. I found this individual at Acacia Reservation in Lyndhurst a couple years ago. And if you don't know the history of Acacia, it was a golf course for 90 years. So it's been in Cleveland Metro Parks Reservation since 2013. Um, we have done a lot of habitat change and a lot of building really helping that landscape kind of be restored from um, all of the work it kept to keep it contained as a golf course. We've done tree planting. There's, we leave brush piles. There's been a lot of opening up the stream beds. And this salamander probably lived in a pond nearby in a development. And I found in just in the middle of the reservation, 
which is pretty amazing when you think even eight, 10 years ago, there would have been pesticides and herbicides all over that park. So even in just the six or seven years since we have been managing it, that it's become a habitat where this salamander was safe and was able to survive and be wandering around looking for a place to spend the winter. Um, I think it's pretty cool. So they are sensitive, but they are durable um, and they're worth it. So thanks for learning about amphibians with me today. If you wanna join us for upcoming virtual programs, um, our School of the Wilds are every Saturday night for the time being at 7 p.m. Uh, next week, you're gonna meet terrific turtles. The week after is mammals of Ohio. And, um, and then I'll be back talking about spring wildflowers. So if there are any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the chat. Thank you for joining me. Let's see. Or spring peepers, tree frogs. Yeah, they're in that family. So they're, you know, they they are in that family of tree frogs. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, oh, Becky asked in Brexville, the metro parks block off the road when they know conditions are right. Will they still do that this year? Yes, we will. Um, so naturalists are working. We are watching for conditions, and um, there is an, an area on the parkway that gets blocked off. So we will do that to make sure they are safe. Oh, Nate asked, how do hybrid salamanders pick up genetic material? So it's kind of wild. Um, these mole salamanders, the way they breed is um, the, you know, the males might do a display and then they basically will uh, drop kind of a, a little genetic packet. Um, I don't remember what it's exactly called. And then the female can walk over it and pick it up. And so that then her eggs would be created with that mix of genetic materials. So that's that's kind of how it works. And it is um, a pretty unique way to, to reproduce, which is pretty cool. Oh, and Gregory said his, her, his wife won an undergraduate tagged salamanders in the Metro Parks. Very cool. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. We hope to see you again soon. Um, at School of the Wilds, or we're also doing in-person programming um, that is registration only and has a maximum of 10 people um, through the Metro Parks. So we hope to see you again soon. Have a great night. Oh, I see. Alex and Andrew asked, are mud puppies related to the hellbender? Yeah, they're in the same family. So we don't have hellbenders in our parks, um, but certainly actually not too far away they are. And if you've never seen a hellbender, totally look it up. They are wild. They can be, you know, a, a foot, two feet long. Giant salamanders live totally underwater, um, kind of hanging around the, the uh, you know, the bottoms of the stream, uh, eating detritus. So they are very cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.